One of the big stories from Monday's election is, of course, the number of high-profile NDP MPs who are now leaving Parliament, including the party's deputy leader, Megan Leslie. She was elected in 2008 and was, over the course of her time in office, the NDP critic for health and the environment. From national pharmacare to suicide prevention, from oil and gas regulations to banning microbeads, she championed critical issues and she put some tough questions to the government. And she famously made friends across the aisle. Lisa Raitt and Michelle Rempel were among them. When when she was elected, McLean's named her best rookie MP. So what's next for Megan Leslie and what will the NDP do without her and the other NDP MPs who lost their seat? Megan Leslie joins me now from Halifax. Good to see you, Megan. It's nice to be here. So what do you think happened on election night? Let's start with uh, your riding and then we mm -hmm. can dig into your party. What, what do you think was happening? Well, there, I mean, if we look at Atlantic Canada, there was a liberal wave that started in the Atlantic and it, it hit all of us. I mean, uh, every single seat in Atlantic Canada is liberal now and uh, it was a wave. So I know from knocking on doors that people were proud of their representation. I got incredible positive feedback on the doorstep. Uh, but it was a lot to do with strategic voting where mm -hmm. people said we need to get rid of Stephen Harper and they did so, voters did so decisively. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, uh, what that meant was we did lose some strong voices in the House, people like Jack Harris, people like uh, Peter Stoffer, Robert Chisholm. We, we lost some feminist voices in the House, yeah. Len Freeman and Lauren Liu and Charmaine Borg. I mean, the waves, they, they, take, they take a lot of uh, collateral damage with them. Paul Dewar uh, told CBC Today mm. that he felt the party wasn't hungry enough. Do, do you have that impression? I mean, like, some of you were, for sure, but the yeah. overall? Wow, he said we weren't hungry enough. Mm. That's interesting. I haven't thought about it that way. I guess... Um, I guess, you know, working on my own campaign and my own riding, uh, I, I really see this as a strategic voting issue. And mm. I think maybe Canadians weren't ready for us, um, didn't, didn't understand what some of the differences were between the NDP and the Liberals. I mean, that's, that's part of one of the, I think there's two issues around uh, strategic voting, and one of them is people with the best of intentions do believe that there is very little policy mm -hmm. difference between mm -hmm. the Liberals and the NDP. And so, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. I, I disagree with them, but unfortunately, I think that's how it's painted. Well, and I wonder if, and I've had conversations with, with NDPers about this throughout the campaign, if maybe those differences weren't highlighted enough, at least not until yeah. the end. You know, C51, uh, TPP, that stuff started to be talked about towards the end of the campaign, but do you feel like yeah. it was talked about enough throughout? Well, I think we ran on some pretty progressive policy points. I mean, certainly C51, but also child care. We were the only party talking about doing national child care, things like uh, climate change and, and greenhouse gas reductions. We were the party who was ranked the best with having the, the strongest targets. So uh, we were trying to highlight them. I think, you know, again, with this idea of anyone but Harper, mm -hmm. um, when I said that with the best of intentions, some people talk about strategic voting and they don't think about the nuance of it. But also, I do think that the Liberals used it to their advantage. Uh, they, they certainly look at ridings, especially in urban centres, and they know that if they create that fear of strategic voting, they can target NDP ridings as well. I mean, we've always known that strategic voting would really play out in the urban centres, uh, like Toronto, yeah. and, and we were wiped out in Toronto, like, like Halifax, like Ottawa. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think should happen with Tom Mulcair? I mean, it, it wasn't a devastating loss. Uh, it's still, as, it, as everyone in the NDP likes to remind me, your second best uh, performance. Yeah. But do you think that he should stay, or do you think that there should be an opportunity for someone else to come in and sort of rebuild? Well, I, I do think it was a devastating loss. I mean, we, we were official opposition. We lost a lot of really great people. We picked up some seats, but we lost a lot. As for Tom Mulcair, I, I'm proud of the campaign he ran. I really am. Uh, he took some very principled positions, and, and I, I couldn't have asked for anything more when it came to those kinds of positions. For right now, I do, uh, I do believe that we need a bit of stability. We've had a rough, a rough four years leading up to the election, as you well know, mm -hmm. and it's time to just take a deep breath. And I think Tom at the helm is, is a positive thing. He can keep us steady. I think he'll be great in the House. Uh, as for what happens next after that, there is a leadership um, uh, evaluation by our party membership in April, so we'll see what happens then. So perhaps not into the next election, though? I think that's up to both Tom and the membership of the party. 
Uh, but what, what the caucus needs right now, I really think they need Tom to stay on, and uh, Tom O'Care stay on, and, and be that steady hand. The fact that people like you, you were a deputy leader and sort of seen as the next generation of, of the NDP, does that, um, does that make it difficult, do you think, for the NDP to move forward? Do you plan to still be a, a voice, a prominent voice within that party? I think that it's going to be difficult for us to move forward regardless of, of who is left in, in that caucus. We need to regroup. Uh, we need to start rebuilding. And that's going to be a difficult thing, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in that and it's going to be an exciting thing. Mm. Uh, as, as for me, I need to think about that. I am a, I'm a proud and loyal member of the NDP and I, and I want to be a part of the rebuilding as a member. Uh, I, don't, I don't see myself having uh, a role beyond that. Hmm. Um, Mr. Trudeau is going to head to the UN Climate Conference, and I, I want to get your take on, on that in Paris mm -hmm. next month. What would you like to see a Liberal government achieve on climate action, and would you be willing to offer advice, uh, opinions, ideas for them as they head into that conversation? Yeah, I'm willing to, I mean, climate change is incredibly important, maybe the most important issue facing us. And I think there are many, many people in this country who might have part, partisan tendencies who'd be willing to put that aside uh, when it comes to climate change and just try and work on getting something done. I would be certainly willing to put that aside. If I can offer any advice, it's just my hope. And my hope is that we come out with targets. Uh, it's fine to say, you know, to furrow your brow and say, gosh, we really care about the environment, but we need to have something on paper in writing to say yes here here's the limit this is what we're going to achieve then let's figure out where, how we get there uh, but I really believe we need targets I, I don't think anything else is going to be enough to convince the international community that we're serious okay I'm gonna leave you with this you you uh, were very well liked in Ottawa you had a lot of cross-party friends so uh, we had one of your friends on yesterday and she had this little message for you here's your singing partner Lisa Ray Megan Leslie was not only my partner in crime when it came to great hosting gigs, both singing and in comedy, she was an excellent parliamentarian who cared deeply about the environment, also cared about women's issues. We got to know each other through equal voice, we became friends through our love of comedy and music, and I wish her all the best in her future endeavours, and I am sure that they are going to be great, but most importantly, they are going to be good. So, Ro Rosie, that was totally unfair. <laughs> That's why I'm ending with it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Megan Leslie. I wish you luck and we'll talk again. <laughs> Thanks.